Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee of Tamil Borough Council on the 6th of October 2022. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, I just want to mention we've got a couple of new members this evening after the vote we had recently at full council for committee places. So welcome to Councillor Michelle Cook and Councillor Andrew Cooper. Uh, Councillors Jason Jones and John Wade have moved uh, away from this onto other committees. I just want to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, and the same for members of the public, you are in shot, so if you're not happy with that, you'd need to leave, obviously. Um, we haven't had any apologies. Does anyone in here know of any? No? I think we've got a full house anyway. Thank you. He's not, sorry? He's not a member of the committee. He's not a member of the council, actually. <laughs> member of parliament, but uh, not, not, the, uh, not the council. Thankfully, we're not Parliament in here. Uh, so, next one, minutes. The minutes of the previous meeting held on the 6th of September are here for approval. Can I request a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Cook and seconded by, I think that was Councillor Cooper. All those in favour, sign the ministry record. Yeah, thank you. Do I need to physically sign them nowadays? Not right now. No? Good. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Do we have any to declare? I assume not. No. Um, for what was going to be an update for me is actually under item six, consideration of matter referred. So I'll refer to that point. Uh, we have no responses to reports. So that moves on to consideration of matters referred to the corporate scrutiny committee from cabinet or council. Um, as you'll all be aware, at full council on the 27th of September, a motion was moved and carried. I'll read it out as follows. That the handling of communications to residents is brought to corporate scrutiny at the first available meeting and specifically how we handle communications to leaseholders. This should include looking at how leaseholders are made, are made aware of their responsibility for payment for works required by Tamarborough Council as freeholder of their properties and their right to influence the council's decisions using the Gilway, Gilway cases we've heard of tonight as our case study. Okay, so um, I believe that's why we've got some members of the public in here tonight. So we, we haven't got it, it's not a agenda item tonight, but the idea is we this was the first available meeting we need to talk through as a group what we feel is appropriate and and how we're going to look at this um so i'll hand over to anyone if anyone's got any suggestions i want to bring forward let's discuss it at this point on how we handle it councillor cook thank you chair um, and again i don't want to kind of steal councillor um, yeah, other okay. cooks um thunder <laughs> on this one because i know he's originally um but between the two of us i think we're Kind of um, really, really glad to see this on the agenda tonight, and, and um, also great to see so many members of the public that have taken the time to come and have a kind of listen um, and to see this issue. And again, great to have Paul here as well. Um, I think the kind of the way I kind of look at this is as I moved in the motion in full council, there seems to be quite a number of inconsistencies in some of the letters, and after meeting and talking with the residents it's quite clear that they do not understand what they've been asked to pay and the reasons why the figures that they are, what they are. Um, and I think really what I would like to see, I know it's not necessarily going to be tonight because we need to kind of go away and decide that, but actually to kind of have a look at those letters, actually get a full record of exactly what's being sent out to different households and actually work out why the figures are as much as they are and actually look at communicating those much much clearer to the residents um, and if that is actually the genuine figure then why and um, that is the case i mean things like for example um the figure that of nine thousand pound that's been banded around per resident if well, up to thirty six thousand, depending on the actual roof type so if it's a block of floor in terms of flats or if it's a semi-detached it's kind of obviously much sig more significant um those figures people aren't aware of the fact that actually are they paying for a daily scaffolding rate as an example or is it a kind of a bulk price and most of the letters actually state that it's an estimated cost now in today's pri world with prices that they are actually there's a real nervousness within that group of individuals that those prices could be significantly higher, especially by the time those works are actually carried out and undertaken. So for me, and I'm going to talk and say Chris kind of agrees with me on this one, 
is that we want to see that full kind of analysis of what's happened and making sure that corporate communications are as clear as humanly possible as part of that. And that, I'll start off there, if that's OK. Chair, thank you. Yep, thank you very much. Um, yeah, totally agree. Um, obviously, our job is to make sure the council has followed this process, meets its objectives, um, and is clear to residents, obviously. Uh, as you said, it's not an agenda tonight. We're not going to have all the detail tonight. My personal view, but I'll hand over to Councillor Cook in a minute, is that we, we rather than set it, rather than put it on the agenda for the next meeting and get a report, which we then discuss, we should probably break off as a have a working group, half of us or something, that look at it in detail and then bring that back for everybody. Otherwise, you're going to run out. Otherwise, it's going to be kicked down the line, and we want to obviously give the residents uh, an answer uh, as soon as possible. So, Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would agree with your sentiment there. Uh, rather than, you know, we, we're demanding of the officer this evening, this is the paper we want to see, this is the process we want to see, come to the next meeting, we discuss it for 30 minutes and, you know, make a recommendation to it somewhere else again, recommend it back to council, recommend it to cabinet. Let's actually go, like you say, a few of us, get a dedicated working group together, let's get the paperwork, let's get a copies, generic copies, you know, without names and addresses at the top, of every letter that's gone out over the time period. So we, we, as a scrutiny committee, we can compare, are they consistent, are they right, are they sending out the right message? Let's look into the details of the policy and see why we enact these things. I mean, there is one tragedy here, and I utterly hold myself fully responsible for this. We had a brief conversation about 10 years ago as a council about entering the Society for Plain English, which means all corporate communications, even legal, that left the building would have to be in plain English. However, the Society for Plain English wanted that much money from a council. We just weren't able to afford it that year, and we just never discussed it again. One, I think, the tragedies we've got is, and, um, you know, it's not Mr. Weston's fault or any officer's fault, is when these letters go out, sometimes in such a legal format, not everybody is a solicitor, but the council has to write that to protect themselves. I think we can do better than that. I think we could send a summary with the letter that says this is what it means. This is what it means to you. Because I think, you know, part of the communication breakdown maybe is the legal language being used that we have to. So let's find a way to break through that. Let's find a way to communicate our residents better. But first and foremost, let's find out, is this a fundamental problem? Because to me, it does sound like there's a fundamental flaw in the system somewhere. And we need to go figure out, is it there, isn't it? And we need to fix it because these residents deserve better than they're feeling right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, totally agree. Hand over to another cook. That's a Chris Cook this time. Not related. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, completely uh, a um, meaning on s s everything that's been um, uh, s Happen, etc. If, if we 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 uh, hardly uh, s working a uh, line group on it, um, s we're actually in the uh, fortunate uh, position of we can have the copies of officers, but we've also got the other copies of residents which we uh, don't redact, etc. And we. You can always um, compare and uh, s uh, s s have a look at absolutely every part of it. Um, uh, I mean, it's not very often as a uh, committee now that we we actually have a look at either side of the party. Uh, I actually reckon that's a, um, a s s s s rather I. Deal, etc. Um, to get it um, kind of done uh, rather sort of quickly, but also uh, 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 thoroughly as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, totally agree. So um, <coughs> obviously, we've got actual copies. Whilst the ones that are on the system should be uh, the ones that were sent out, if we've got actual copies, it's always right to look at both to make sure there's not a difference from what's going on. Yeah. Councillor Sheree, people. Thanks, Chair. Um, without wanting to uh, prolong the discussion, I agree with what's been said, and I'm happy to volunteer to be part of the working group if my legal background can be of any assistance. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, Councillor Michelle Cook. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the other thing as well that I'm really, really conscious of is after meeting with the residents on Monday, you can really see the sense of distress that some of them are feeling. Some of them are annoyed and angry. Others are genuinely concerned about a, how they're going to actually pay those bills. Secondly, what happens if they refuse to pay them um, in the short term? And also, some of them are and I don't think anyone would kind of complain if I said this, were elderly individuals that were living on their own who are not sitting at home with family members being able to actually have those conversations. And I think there is that kind of, again, duty of care that we've got for our leaseholders as someone that's living within our blocks that actually we need to be offering them that support and compassion as well. So actually very very quickly some sort of direction from kind of yourselves kind of mr west and others is to actually find out what's going to happen because we know also the council needs to make a decision sooner rather than later when they're going to do this for other residents so there is a kind of there's the general what's going on from a corporate perspective in terms of communications but there's also how we move this forward as well um, and things like for example getting the contractors in to actually talk to the residents so they understand some of those things and actually have a QA and a on what's going to happen so that running concurrently with this because ultimately we get to go away and dare I say part this until and we have a meeting or an agenda these individuals will go home tonight or potentially log on to watch it online will be told at their next meeting and sit and worry about it. And potentially, as we all know, these decisions don't get made quickly. Um, so I think that's just something I've, I really wanted to bring to the table. But also, as kind of you said, Councillor Othercock, um, <laughs> sorry, actually, some of the letters are legal and they have to be. I work in an environment where, as Mr Weston knows, because I've um, been in that position, um, where those left, I can will go, oh, actually, can we say in a different way, etc. But we have to say certain things in a certain way to make the letters legally upstanding. So it's, again, translating that between what's a legal letter and what's the human version on top and making sure that people have the opportunity for that FAQ as well. Thank you for indulging me there, Chair. No problem, thank you. Uh, Councillor Danny Cook, do you want to come in? Yeah, just a quick moment of clarification from the officer, if you can, please, Mr Chairman. Is this at all time sensitive in any way? Have we targeted all these roofs are going to fall off on the 7th of December or something? Or is it something we can pause while we just figure this out? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, effectively, our programmes are based on stock condition data. Uh, we, we use that as the base of determining when roofs are likely to fail. We do have a programme then of a pre-inspection before we start works, just to make sure that those roofs do actually need replacing. Uh, and we take photographic evidence and all that type of stuff just to sort of say that, yeah, we've got the details, we've got a survey of an actual survey as opposed to just a stock condition survey. Uh, are they like to fall off? Well. I can't say either way on that one. I mean, you know, that's going to be based very much on the inspection. I don't think there are any in such a poor state that they're going to fall off this week. Uh, but like I say, they, they will all have a finite life. Thank you. And through you again, Mr Chairman. Sorry, so we've not done the pre-inspection yet? We've got stock condition data. We've got information on most of the properties, but we do a detailed pre-inspection before those works start just to sort of validate what we need what we need okay. to do on those properties. I think what I'm trying to get to on that is, if you went and did the pre-inspection and all of a sudden the roofs aren't desperate for right now... Then we, we won't replace them immediately. Yeah. I'm just wondering, have we put these residents through a ton of pain that we may not have needed to, is my question. Highly unlikely, because we know from those areas that most of those properties are at that point of time where the roofs have come to end of life, because they've got a finite life. I'll, I'll leave it there for now, Mr Chairman. I'm happy to wave the working group. Yeah, thank you. So, I hundred. Councillor Goodall, quickly, and then I'll sum up and we'll... we'll uh... Okay, Councillor Goodall. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I think the sentiment of the room is that we, we carry this forward, uh, look at it on a working group, and then, then come back at an appropriate time. So I think the time for discussion tonight, otherwise we're going to end up um, looking at something that really isn't on the agenda. Mm. Thanks, Chair. Yep. That's, yep, that's what I said. So I'm going to sum up, so Michelle, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. Thank you. And my one final, final point, again, if in that instance of kind of when there's a stock condition survey, et cetera, 
one of the individuals that apparently has received um, a letter is someone who, still not quite sure how and why, but um, basically it was apparently, again, interpreted and um, informed that they needed to do some work um, because it was, there was storm damage or something similar. And anyway, this particular individual went and actually paid £5,000 to have their part of the roof replaced themselves. I'm sure you're aware of that particular case. Again, it's a brand new roof with a 15-year guarantee, and it's been done for five years, but we're still telling them that they need to pay £9,000 to have so, that done. So in that particular instance, can we pick it up and say, if it's been done and it doesn't need to be done, and we can get some sort of condition survey to say it has been done to a fit and proper standard, can we look at something like an indemnity policy to at least take that person off? So can I just say... We, as the, an example, uh, it was just so, that particular one, um, I thought if we'd say that's something that's not, that can be picked up quite quickly, hence yeah. why I wanted to say it. So I've got one volunteer so far, so far. Yeah. so if you're not in the working group, then I'll say this, tell that to Sheree, um, and we'll, we'll get that added. So, um, as I said, it's not an agenda item tonight. However, we, it was referred to us last week. This is the first meeting we could actually get together and discuss it. Um, we can't promise that anything will change. We can't promise we'll find anything wrong. However, we appreciate this. Um, uh, you know, it's a hot issue at the moment. The residents are understandably feeling what they're feeling, and we um, want to do it as quickly as possible. And that's why we're just uh, going to set up a working group, which to the um, residents in the room, working group is essentially we will meet outside of council meeting time in our own time, um, and you can spend a lot more time looking at it before bringing it back to the next possible meeting. So we're going to do it as quickly as possible. So we have one volunteer so far, it's Councillor People. Anyone else want to join that group? So, Johnny Cook. <laughs> Too many cooks. Um, is that, you, you want to join that group as well? So we've got five people. Yeah? John as well? Okay. So we've got six volunteers. Um, we will, we'll get that in, and we've got a meeting. Uh, that's, what is it? So we've got another meeting in November. So we'd want to have the meet working group um, meet and report back. If you've got something you want to discuss with the whole committee, obviously we can put another meeting in, or we can have an informal teams meeting or something, if there's something sooner than that. But obviously we want to do it as quickly as possible for the residents. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, and the residents that have come for that item, if you want to stay for the rest, then you're more than, more than welcome. We've got, um, we're looking at gun gate regeneration, market updates. All right. Thank yeah. All right, thanks very much. <clears throat> so that moves on to first substantive item seven, gun gate regeneration program terms of reference. We've got Councillor Steve Doyle, Portfolio Holder for Skills, Planning, Economy and Waste, as well as Matt Fletcher, Head of Economic Development and Regeneration. So I'll hand over to Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Mr Chairman and members of the committee for inviting me and Matt. The purpose of this session is to provide corporate scrutiny with an opportunity to feedback on the draft of terms of reference for the Programme Governance Board prior to consideration by Cabinet, as the Council is now able to start the creation of a formal governance structure to oversee emerging projects. I was going to explain who Matt is, but they've all gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll now hand over to Matt to take you through the report and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Oh, John, sorry, excuse me. Sorry, can we, uh, we thank you. Apologies, Chairman. Okay, um, thank you, Councillor Dorr. So, yeah, in terms of um, the report, um, what we've presented um, tonight, at times of writing the report, um, we just had a very draft um, terms of reference here that will basically form the basis of decision making for um, the Gun Gates Regeneration Programme. So, um, those of you that might have be aware of how the Future High Street Fund um, is set up, there's a programme board and then a um, delivery um, working group. And all this terms of reference does at the moment is proposed to replicate that and um, just sets out broadly um, each the responsibilities for each group um, and what they can or can't do. Um, 
and we've brought it to this group tonight really for any comments that we may take forward into the final proposals um, any views um, that anyone may have who's been sitting on the future high street fund program board or um, have got any comments around how it might be different or improved and we've just highlighted there um, in the report in yellow areas that we're just um, reviewing at the moment i should also state as well we're also reviewing um, the programme delivery team um, to see if that's still relevant in the same context of um, Gungate compared to future High Street Fund. Um, it, it may or may not be needed yet, so we're reviewing that at this moment um, in time. Um, or we, the programme delivery team might just be more focused on sort of a project team, whereas at the moment the future High Street Fund one is more of um, internal officers and then the separate project teams. So it will depend on the nature of the programme going forward, I think. But really, in terms of the terms of reference, we're not um, suggesting any significant change to how it currently operates. Okay, thank you very much. So this is, um, as we've tried to do in, normally in the past, so this is a pre-cabinet review. So this, the, we're, gonna, we're seeing it tonight. If you've got any, this is a chance to make any suggestions or amendments, have any input before it goes to cabinet for decision. So. I'll hand over to committee if you've got any comments or suggestions. So people. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just interested in terms of the membership of the board. I think when the Future High Street Fund Board was first proposed, there was a suggestion that members of the opposition would be part of that. Well, that didn't come to fruition. And it looks as if this is going to be exactly the same. Um, so I wondered if anybody would like to comment on that. Over to, to you, Matt, or, or Steve. I'll be honest, I've not got a lot to say on that one. I'm prepared to take it back and discuss it with Cabinet. Danny, go on then. I was leader when the project started. Yes, there was an offer to offer to have the leader of the opposition on that because I did that deal with your husband Simon at the time. I don't know why it's not been followed through. Um, there was there was an offer at the time to do it. Yes. Yeah, come in, come in. Yes, there was. Um, I don't know why it wasn't followed through. I think it's an opportunity missed. Um, I think members of the opposition are tired of being treated as if we're non-citizens, non-members and don't exist. Um, and we, we, we have lots to contribute and we're very happy to, to do that uh, if we're given the opportunity. Well, that's what we're having now, right? So you've got the opportunity to make a suggestion. We can have it added before we go to Cabinet and then what they decide obviously is, is up to them, not us. But if, if we want to add that in, we can, you know, this committee can do that. So. Go for it. Yes, Chair, thank you. I've made the suggestion. We've got that noted down. Do you want to reword it? Just when it reworded, rehash, just so you got it correctly, what we're suggesting. Can I just clarify, are we, is this a, a recommendation to Cabinet that you want to make at this point in time? Can or, um, And then if, if necessary, it would need to be moved and seconded and, and voted yeah. on in this committee. I'm not sure if you're quite ready yet for that. Yeah, if you, if you want to word that motion, so we can write it down. If you want to put, put a motion, we can do that. I'm happy to do that. Chair, thank you. You asked for suggestions on the paper. I've made a suggestion that the membership of the programme board should reflect the broad spectrum of uh, councillors on the council. Um, how the cabinet wants to do that, I guess, is up to them. But that, that is a suggestion that I'm making. Um, I'm happy to make it in the form of a, of a formal proposal or motion if anybody would like to second it. So, question for Joe then. Do we need it as a motion? Or if we're here to be able to give comments or suggestions, can they not be added as such before we go to Cabinet? How does that work? The, the report here asks for comments and suggestions, so it would be up then to the portfolio holder in to then take forward those in his report when it's amended and goes forward to Cabinet, if that's what the will of the committee were. Come on then, uh, Steve Doyle. Um, I've already made a note of it, and I'm going to take it back to discuss with Cabinet. Um, if we met the commitment originally, all I can think of is it's got ch uh, lost in the change of leadership, uh, but I will take this back. I'll be honest, I didn't... I've... 
I wasn't. Um, I will take this back to cabinet, and I will point out that we made the commitment to have a member of the opposition on there. Why it's been missed, uh, I'm not sure. But all I can do is offer to apologise on that one and take it forward. Okay, I think Simon, you're first, and then all right, go on then, Danny. Do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to officially move the motion. <laughs> Um, that the um, working group slash board for Future High Streets Fund has an opposition member for balance, and that member is agreed by the two leaders of the two opposition parties. Uh, would you be comfortable seconding my motion, Cherry? Very happy to, thank you. Before we do that, before we do that, Councillor Goodall. Thanks, Chair. Um, the programme board is composed of A and other to be agreed dependent upon final projects. So I think actually, there's an opportunity within the scope of the document for that to, for it to be any member, whether it be opposition or not. So just pointing that out. Um. I mean, either way. I mean, if it's added as a suggestion, if it's added to the report, if there's a motion to add it. it We've had a first move and a second. Uh, the outcome's the same. I think we're all in agreement. It needs to have a balance. The, you know, the political makeup of the of the, cha the council could change over that time. You know, it's, it's right to have a balance, in my view. So, we've had a move and a seconder. Do you want to debate it? I don't think it's a particular political hot potato either, is it? No, no. Let's have a vote then. All those in favour of adding it as a motion. All those against. Abstentions, that's carried. Cool, easy. Do you have any other suggestions, comments from Matt or Steve? Danny? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I think Matt and Steve will be very comfortable to know I'm not gonna get in the way of this any way, shape or form. As I think you, I started the ball rolling in 2018. Uh, obviously, the recommendations did make me chuckle. We're recommended to do what we're doing anyway. <laughs> so, just a, a language thing there. But no, I abs absolutely support this 100%. I've got to admit, when I first heard that, you know, the potential was for a, you know, a, a new council building on that part of the Gungate South, I thought that's a little bit unambitious. But the more and more I thought about it, I thought, actually, this takes me back to the days when I was discussing with officers what we nicknamed Operation Domino. You know, it's basically, we get out of Miami and House, purpose-built 21st century compliant building on a part of Gungate. That then opens up the other part of Gungate, which will then resolve the car parking issue on Gungate, which then frees the land of Miami House. And we get exactly where I was trying to get started in 2018, which is a domino effect of every bit of land in our town centre solving another one's problem. And over time, we'll see the town centre vastly improve if we continue to allow those dominoes to fall. So actually, when I thought originally it was uninspiring, the more I thought about it, it does open the door for us to do so much more longer term using different pieces of land to improve our wonderful town centre. So, yeah, highly supportive of it. No, no complaints whatsoever. Thank you for that. Anyone got anything else to add? <clears throat> no. So I think we've got some sort of generic recommendations in there that we review and consider it at the draft terms of reference. Uh, they make any comments or recommendations on that which we just we've just added one so i'm assuming we've i'm happy to move that simon thanks chair just a comment about the um the cost caps that are highlighted in the in the report how comparable are they with the future high street fund cost caps for authority to release funds thank you so at the moment, these are identical with the Future High Street Fund. Um, so um, because I've not been closely involved with the delivery of Future High Street Fund, all we've done is highlight them to see whether anything needs adjustment from learning to see whether decisions, have, you know, um, there's any caps that need changing. So um, I'll be sitting down with the relevant people to make sure that, you know, they might need amending. They probably will stay as they are. But, um, yeah, it was just to flag, um, you know, any learning really from the Future High Street Fund programme. Thank you. So just indicative, really. But yeah, thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, so we've already discussed and debated it. With my view, I'm happy to move them. Do I have a second there, Councillor Michelle Cook? All those in favour? Against? Was that it? Against? Four. <laughs> Abstentions? 
All right, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Doyle, for attending. Uh, so that moves on to item eight. And I haven't thanked you, Matt, because you're here for the next item. <laughs> uh, street market update. So there was a report at the August meeting, which you all reviewed. I was on holiday. Um, definitely not thinking about markets at that point. And um, you requested the officer attend a future meeting because it was unavailable at that meeting. So here he is. And um, do we have any burning questions that we you didn't have in you didn't get to ask in August? Now the Matt is here about the market, please. Hope so as we've called him in. Councillor Harper. Um, yeah, just basically, if we could just kick off with um, what future plans do you have for development of the market in the future? Um, to increase possibly the size and diversity and uh, the, the type of um, produce that is, is being um, sold on the market. Basically, uh, what plans have you got to upgrade the market from what it currently is? Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Um, so as you know, um, the market is operated by LSD um, Promotions, which is um, a regional market operator. So we work very much um, in partnership with them. And as part of the uh, tender process um, that we went through um, about 18 months to two years ago now, um, part of that had to say how the market would be developed over the five year term that they um, were in place. So in the report that I did back in August, it showed a number of things that they'd put in place. The intention is um, from LSD, they want to turn it into um, what's really in, in many terms now is like a new generation market. So very much away from um, traditional markets um, that sold sort of, um, you know, your fruit and veg into something um, probably, you know, in between that, um, more towards um, artisan um, locally produced goods, um, more niche um, items, whether that's um, antiques, um, collectors, um, into things like music. So um, there's, um, there's a sustained plan um, by the market to try and introduce different um, uses and expand it over the time. Obviously, this is also significantly tied into the plans for the future High Street Fund as well, particularly around um, some of the areas around St. Editha's Square, making that um, you know, a more appropriate space to have the market. You know, I think we'll all be aware, we're um, walking through the town centre, um, there's quite a lot of street furniture, um, you know, whether that's bins, bike racks, um, different obstacles in the way that actually make the market you know, um, quite difficult to set out. So, um, in, a, in answer to your question, you know, th there's a there's general aspiration and vision there to grow and change the market into something that suits a wider demographic and not just perhaps the people that currently use it. Without you know, not forgetting those people either. But there's you know, there's a, a number of challenges. But the market is already um, particularly it's done. Um, things like the uh, Young Traders competition. Um, it's working with our arts and events team as well to put on um, a number of food festivals. The idea being that pulling in different traders to Tamworth to see what a great town it is in terms of the backdrop um, and then connect that to the market and then try and convert some of those, but also then try and generate footfall to the wider market, but also show, you know, bring in people from Tamworth that wouldn't necessarily come into the town centre to those and then that might come into the town centre. So, you know, there's definitely an aspiration there and a vision there to change the demographic of the market. The, the challenges are, though, you know, that I think particularly market trading is, is quite a difficult profession, you know, and I think um, particularly over COVID, we have seen quite a few market traders generally, you know, um, change professions um, to careers that are perhaps more financially stable, you know. So, um, so I think you know, there's without doubt there's a challenge there to make the market adapt. But um, I think the you know the market operator is fully aware of that. Um, 
and you know they operate markets like i said across different regions and are taking the learning from that and applying it to here and how we do it but you know i think some of the physical changes that we'll see over the next couple of years in the town center will significantly help the market in terms of location and where it can go and backdrop as well thank you very much um <clears throat> I got a question. Do you want to come in? I'll let you come in first. I'll ask mine after. Go on. You carry on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Get no privilege. Um, so I just want to really, it's going to be really boring now compared to Cherie's question, I'm sure. Um, how are they adhering to the contractual obligations? So I remember there was obligations on them to do certain events every X months. Um, and when it started, I was seeing them. It might just be that I'm not seeing the ads and things for these, these things now. But I was it before, and I've not seen any since. So, how are they adhering to the actual contractual obligations regarding particularly events, but in general? Yeah. So, um, so in terms of the in terms of the wider food festival events, um, they've. Uh, I think there's another one coming up in about two weeks. So they will have done three. Um, yeah, you know, the, there are areas we do need to address with them. We've recognised that around um, certainly some of the standards um, that we need to pick up with them and we're looking at we're looking at that now as we speak um, so I think to be honest there are areas that need to be improved there are other areas where it is going quite well you know like they're bringing in of the food festivals for example the new food festival they're putting on they've had more demand than they've ever had and they've got a waiting list um, but you know there are challenges then about where that can where that can go and tying that into the town centre. So I think, I think to be honest, um, there are areas where performance needs to be examined in more detail. Um, you know, because we, we saw, you know, we did see a lot of activity at the start and a lot of change and we're still on that, but there are areas I think we, we can push more and improve upon. Okay, thank you, Councillor People. Thank you very much. I was also on holiday in August, um, enjoying the sunshine. Um, so unfortunately, wasn't uh, wasn't present for that meeting. But I've read the report, um, and also I'd like to pick up on the point that you were making about changes to the town centre and how that might affect. Um, looking at St Editha's Square, it's always struck me that that's that's an ideal market square. You know, that that's probably what we should have been doing all along, and what we've tended to have. Uh, over the past few years is a few little stalls dotted around in there we're not using it to its fullest capacity um i know that we've had lots as councillors we've had lots of represent representations about the removal of the the canopy in st edith's square and i think that's causing some residents some um concern that they think it should stay but we're told that it's come to the end of its natural life and isn't sort of repairable so fair dues but if that goes then that presumably is going to make more space available for the market which is a very rambling way of actually ask, asking my actual question which is will there be more space down here as well once the bits of middle entry have been um reconfigured for the market so i i haven't seen the final plan so um, going to the point of St Editha Square, yeah, we, um, when I put together the Future High Street Fund sort of general high level propositions, we engaged with the market at the time and the plan was yeah, to make St Editha Square more usable and then what the market then would do would, you know, having a space that was easier to set out stalls and a bit more of a flow, then they felt strongly then they could use that as an influence to get market traders to go there because also you'd have a new building and new access and lots of other reasons so yeah i think you know but but i i can't comment on what the final plans are for these and editors because i haven't seen the actual delivered schemes but i know i, I think the, my understanding is the intention is still there that you know it's a much more usable space in terms of street furniture and you know items that don't get in the way of market stores so coming down um to um to middle entry my understanding again there is there will be a little bit of space available but again i haven't seen the final designs but there is quite a level change um so um i, th I think from from memory um there was a space outside the new units that are going to be built um i don't know sort of the parameters or size of that at the moment to be able to say whether market stores would go there certainly um you know the intention is to have space but i can't sort of um comment on that 
at the moment. I don't, I don't know is the honest answer. Thank you. Do you want to follow up on that, yeah? If I could just come back in, um, thank you for the answer and, and for being honest enough to say that you don't know. Um, but maybe it's just something that we could be born in mind so that we're, we're thinking in a joined up way about the best use of the space for all the different purposes that we want to use it for. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Chris Cook. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the city going back uh, to obviously um, realising there's um, certain aspects of the uh, performance which you are actually looking at. Um, I mean, obviously, this won't be looked at over night, etc. But have you got any um, deadline in kind of mind of when you want it all kind of looked at? Uh, just kind of by. It's a it's a continual process, really. I mean, um, from from my perspective. Um, the um, new contract started again um, last summer, so you know we'd want to continue working with them to see where they're getting at, um, where, how they're how they're progressing. Um, but certainly, you know, be very clear really within the next three years if we're not seeing significant change, because then we've got a plan for the next contract really. So I would see in the next eighteen months to two years a strong position coming out of you know. A strong story or narrative if we're not seeing sort of a change particularly with the timeline of some of the physical developments as well really you know which is an opportunity um you know yeah so i'd, I'd hope to see something within the next 18 months to two years as more of a timeline as an indication of travel okay thank you uh councillor danny cook thank you mr chairman um, yeah, echo um, of course, uh, Councillor People's point about St Edith's Square being perfect. Uh, I'm sure we've all got our opinions of what's in there, but it always does make me laugh that St Edith's Square was designated in the 1960s as an open space for the public of Tamworth to gather. We then went and stuck an anchor, some trees and a tent in it. That went really well, that did, didn't it? <laughs> but hey, yeah, it, it, it is good that, you know, the future ICU is going to open up some more opportunities for the market. It's good to see. A uh, question for myself, Matt, because... Um, it's something I do get curious about sometimes. Obviously, within the contract, there is a requirement for you to have three monthly meetings with the market um, management team to look at ideas to improve. Are those proving fruitful and are they happening every month? Sorry, every three months? So, um, being honest, um, they're relatively fruitful. They're still in their early stage. Um, we have um, missed um, one meeting because we've had um, quite lengthy staff absence. So, um, we have you know, be honest, we have missed one, but we do have regular um, contact with the market and with the market operator, so we know what's going on. Um, so, so yes, I think um, they are proving it's not something we had in the past, and they are proving certainly more, um, you know, interesting and understanding about what's actually happening. You know, like I've put in the report, we wouldn't have understood in the past some of the unique changes, you know, around the impacts of COVID, you know, people going off to be lorry drivers and things like that and changes within um, the different market holders and things like that. So I think we've got a better understanding through those meetings and a better relationship with the market. Um, definitely, you know, but, you know, honestly, yeah, there has been a, a meeting that was missed due to staff illness that's, um, you know, just unavoidable, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you. Through you again, Mr Chairman. Um, very loaded question, Matt. Feel free to say I don't know. Um, just, just putting it out there because obviously I was involved a little bit with yourself in the project at the time. Obviously, we put the market out to tender during COVID. With a strategy for the market written that was pre-COVID, we've now come out. We let the contract during COVID. We've now come out the other side of COVID to a different commercial world with a lot of different challenges, certainly around cost of living, cost of fuel, everything else. Is there a danger that our strategy needs a review because we're in a different world than we set out to when we set out to tender the market? Is, is there a danger that actually, if we put a deep dive review into it from an officer level, and I don't know what capacity you've got, Matt, and I doubt it's not much, um, but are we in danger of actually we've re-entered a different world from the one we let the contract in? Is that a danger? 
That's a really interesting question. So, Would you like to? yeah, no, it's a really interesting question. And the answer is I don't know. Um, so, obviously, we've entered, we've entered a completely different world. Um, and, you know, not even similar to the recession back in 2007 and eight. it's a completely different tone, context. Um, my view is review is always important. So I think that's the first thing to say. I think, with, you know, particularly me, we constantly review things and we constantly challenge and check. So I think something, something needs to be looked at with, um, you know, with the operator to understand how their wider markets are being impacted by COVID. Um, you know, bearing in mind that Tamworth has a few unique challenges with the physical regen that's going on. So, you know, I, th I think certainly, yeah, there is there is a opportunity to review it. And I think only time will tell whether the current situation as it progresses will either benefit the market because people will be looking for that sort of option and what perhaps the market provides, or whether the external challenges on market traders will prove to be too much that other opportunities and careers, you know, um, appear. And I, and I think that's the major difference that we've seen since COVID is that the jobs market is relatively strong still and the opportunities are there in terms of financial skills transfer. I hope that answers your question, Councillor Good. Thank you very much. Michelle Cook, Councillor Michelle Cook, still got a question? Um, yes, but... Just a quick one. I mean, obviously, I wasn't on the committee last time, so apart from skim reading through kind of the report side of things, I haven't, well, been witness to the kind of the full stuff. However, question about weather. So again, with the kind of the canopy issue, the fact it's kind of going. Is there anything when you look at kind of should we say feedback from the actual market themselves? that are saying that they've got concerns about the lack of kind of over, well, lack of canopy type things or not in terms of footfall, i.e. if it's pouring down a miserable day, does it have an impact and is it something that we do need to look at long term, especially when weather keeps changing and we're coming into winter, is it an actual genuine issue? Because no one wants to get wet, but does it actually genuinely impact on footfall or not? Um, so I'd, I'd have to ask the operator in detail, but my understanding is so that, you know, obviously bad weather does naturally affect an open street market. You know, it will, it will naturally put um, people off coming into a town centre, wherever it is. However, in terms of then um, the market traders themselves, and in particular reference to the sort of canopy in the square, all of the, um, all of the stalls are provided with covers themselves and waterproof as well so from that perspective no you know naturally people won't walk around as much in the rain or when it's stormy and obviously in really bad weather then the market will cancel so you know i think yeah and, and that's any place i think with with the traders and in particular reference um you know to the canopy itself you know it's it's only traders that we're aware of that are used to that sort of cover that have an issue but all traders are issued with um, a wet, a, a roof and a cover. So that's great. I mean, one would assume that when it's pouring down the rain, less people will choose to go in. I suppose it's that point because there's been quite a bit of publicity recently, especially on kind of social media, which people do look at about it. Is there something that the comms team can do to support in actually saying to people things are under cover? I think kind of still come and visit us, i.e. you can browse under the covers that are there, under those, and I think just for a bit of support potentially, i.e. combating some of the negative publicity. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Do you want to come back in there, Matt? Or you just, you just, no? No, cool. Yeah, I saw the canopy point. I just think... Um, if it's raining, you'll avoid coming out to the market anyway. It's not going to be the canopy that think, well, I'll run through the rest of town, get wet, because I'll be drying under the canopy. It's more for the, those that are working under it than for, for that's my view as a non-market trader anyway. Councillor Harper. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's actually just a very small point on, uh, on probably something that you mentioned earlier. 
Um, I'm sure I've read something or seen something about um, the provision of uh, performance art or music or so forth being used to make the market more of an event rather than it just being there, a reason to go there um, with a, a sort of an area that we could um, have some sort of a an artistic or musical event that would entertain visitors and make the market more of a more of an occasion. Uh, for instance, I went to, well, this was Christmas. It was at uh, Litchfield last year. And it was just a normal Christmas market. But they got a group of, a carol group, who were blasting out carols. It was fabulous. The place, the market square in Litchfield was packed. Everyone was in a jovial mood. It worked an absolute treat. Have we got any plans or future aspirations to do that sort of thing? Thank you. I can raise it with the um, operator. I mean, when they do their food festivals, they put um, different events on. I think, um, you know, what, you, what you're talking about in the general market, you know, what, that happens twice a week, you know, every week of the year, it's probably something they can explore on certain occasions and, and have done, so I'll, I'll raise it with them. Thank, thank, thank you. you. I wasn't. I wasn't talking actually on the uh, probably just the the Saturday market, which is the important one, really. I suppose. But um, if people got used to that sort of thing, it would be a reason to come down to the market, which doesn't currently doesn't exist. And um, it's certainly worth worth exploring. I would suggest. And uh, whether it's ourselves or the market operators who establish something on those lines would need to be decided. But I certainly think it's, it's worth looking at. Thank you. I think uh, Council Harbour's right. So now we talked earlier about the events, and we talked immediately to the food and drinks events, right? But um, I'll give an example. I think it was Burton. They had a, it was just a normal market, but they had a poor patrol day. If, if you don't know what poor patrol is, it's a fantastic kids show. And um, my daughter loves it. So we went to Burton just because they had these poor patrol characters. The market was as terrible as Burton Market is anyway, but we spent money there because we were there. Because the Paw Patrol was there, we ended up spending money, and it was people who wouldn't have gone to the market coming in and spending money there just because of this uh, character <coughs> event. So, uh, Cool. Danny Cook, you were next. And then Andy Cooper. 20 quid says the uh, Mayor of East Staffordshire Borough Council demands an apology from you within a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was actually going to move a motion, so I'm happy to wait till the end, Mr Chairman, if you'd prefer. Sure, no problem. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo Councillor Harper's point. Um, Covent Garden do a similar thing where local uh, artists and musicians are invited in to, to do their perf various performances and play music. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's stayed with Covent Garden for decades and it makes that, that area of the, their, their sort of market a really sort of up, upscale and fun and a good place to go to. Um, what I will say, uh, just just a general point, is I kind of get the feeling that the Tamworth market is being left behind a little bit by other local um, towns that are doing a little bit more with a little bit more imagination. Um, and, and that is only by the, the communications I've heard here tonight. So I would I would like to, uh, to, to sort of put a bit more pressure on our market providers to come up with a few more ideas and get especially with the future high street fund coming in because that is that that square over in in, in editor square i mean you know i'd love to own a pub right on the outskirts of it because that's going to become quite a good place come uh, come you know a, a couple of years once the future future high street funds landed with the students in the college and it's going to be the go-to place in tamworth so, so it would be a shame if i'd have had a, a pub that's just closed down there uh, but uh, that's a separate point um so, but uh, but no uh, an imaginative uh, a few imaginative ideas in and around the uh, the the um, the marketplace would be a good thing to see thank you yeah, thank you. And I think you misheard me before. I said the market was, was brilliant, but I wouldn't normally have gone there other than the poor patrol. That's what I think came out wrong. Um, so, Danny, did you want to come in with your motion? Have you got your pen ready, Joe? I just want to obviously revisit the comments I made earlier and a couple of things that have been said around the room is, you know, the tender we wrote for the market was written in COVID. We let the market in COVID. The strategy was for pre-COVID conditions. Is the strategy still correct when we've entered a completely different world, as we know? 
I would like to move the motion that corporate scrutiny request cabinet to do a deep dive review of the strategy short, short and long term for the market just to ensure it is still correct. Cabinet will rightly ask where's the money. I would ask that a maximum of £10,000 be spent on it to be found within budget. If it cannot be found within budget it is taken from the, capital, from the revenue contingency budget. I'd like to move that motion Mr Chairman. So we have a motion moved. Do we have a do you want to? Okay. Seconded by Councillor Michelle Cook. Do you want to debate it? Your hand went up, so I'm assuming yes. Yep, Councillor Goodall. I think it's a very specific motion. I would certainly suggest that we uh, we recommend make a recommendation to cabinet, but not request them because I don't think we can request them to do to do anything. We can request. Re well, it's words, isn't it? Um, and I think specifying an amount of of, uh, of of revenue to use, I think, is a little bit too specific, personally. Okay. Do you want to propose a reworded motion? And we can decide on that. Well, I, I would I would say we, we recommend um, a review of the market tender because of the change in business conditions, mm. um, but not specified using the words that Council Cook made. Okay, so you're moving that? Yeah. Seconded by Councillor Cooper. Happy to remove my motion and I'll support Councillor Goodall's motion. Thank you. Well, that was easier than I was expecting. Good. <laughs> Do we have any more debate or should we go to a vote on that? Councillor Cook. Chris Cook. Um, can I slightly alter your motion? <laughs> Um, taking into account what was in that motion and what we've now got into this motion, I completely agree with kind of both of them, but use a bit of common sense. We don't want to overspend, literally looking at it. So would you be happy if we said they spend, obviously, um, uh, like just kind of up to uh, 10,000? That's a question to you, Councillor Goodall. I didn't give any figures in my motion. No, but he did. <laughs> yeah, but that's been withdrawn. Oh, all right. <laughs> so you're proposing another motion, right? <laughs> Go on then, Councillor Cook. Yeah, just obviously supporting Councillor Simon Goodall's motion, but obviously it's to review the strategy, not the tender, because we've given a five year contract to LSD now, so we can't go. So just to clarify that. Uh, the only reason I put figures to it is because I've been a leader at this council and I've chaired cabinet meetings. And the greatest kickback you can ever give a scrutiny chairman when he sits there is, have you investigated how much it's going to cost? Go away and tell me that before I accept this recommendation. That's why you've got to be very careful what you send to cabinet sometimes. Okay. So you're proposing another motion or are we happy to support this amendment to that motion? Well, we've had a move in a second of that one. You remove it. Yeah. Is it on this particular? Yeah. Then okay, yeah, we'll allow that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just an observation from myself. You're recommending an investigation of the market as it stands because it's changed over the last two years. We're about to go through a significant amount of change in the town centre. So for me, or from my perspective, wouldn't it be worth waiting until you're close to the end of finishing those changes in the town centre before you reassess the market? Because you're going to end up doing the same thing at the end of that period. Just an observation from yourself. Okay, thank you. Councillor Michelle Cook. Thank you. In principle, I completely agree with Councillor Doyle. My only nervousness with that is that people now and for the interviewing period of time are reliant on the market as it currently stands from their businesses and if there's something we could do in the short term to amend if there is an issue to enhance and encourage more people to come and use the market then that potentially gives them a great opportunity in this really unsettling challenging time so looking at it as part of potentially 
the projects that we've kind of got going on at the moment to go what can we do i'm assuming anyway we're looking at how we can support businesses as part of our kind of major projects it might want to sit into that more than a standalone issue potentially but i'm just conscious people are reliant on paying their mortgages now so we don't want to do something that says let's look at it down the line that would be my so i'm gonna say that it doesn't mean that the cabinet has to look at it in isolation right they can they could agree with it and say right we're going to fit it into whatever yeah. review yeah did you want to come back in as an answer now yeah just a point for councillor doyle i get what he's going to yes Obviously, the town is about to go through some changes to future ice fund, funds, so we wait on a review of the market until that's finished. Then we start throwing up gun gates, so we wait until that finishes. Then we all have a fight in the town all about who gets to press the plunger on Marmion now, and we kick it down the road. At some point, you've got to draw a line and say, we need to review this strategy. The time is now because we're in a different world to when the strategy was released. I think it's time to do it now. Councillor Cooper, did you have do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I just want to make two points. I, th I agree with uh, Councillor Cook. I think the time is now, uh, and he, he, you know, he, he is right. There, there's always something in the plan to be, do you know, referencing what he said earlier about the domino effect. You know, ultimately there is always going to be something. Um, we we do need to get on it and have a look at it now. I think the the, the basis of fact is that it was brought in off the back of um, changing lifestyle habits due to COVID and a potential global recession in the, the economic climates that we currently face ourselves in now. So let, let's get on and do it now. I think to come back on Councillor, other Councillor Cook's point, um, with regards to supporting around the uh, market, I think free market is what the free market is. And yeah, I'm a little bit reticent to offer a lot of support to, you know, I, th I think, the, I think, I think to be honest, the, the council gets quite a lot of support. With, uh, the market will get quite a lot of support with, with people in the town and the future high street fund and everything else and yeah free free market enterprise thought on that really it, it will adapt and change as for us to try and influence it from an external point of view i don't think is ever really a good idea just my personal opinion all right thank you council street people thanks chair just a point of clarification really i'm I'm, I'm perhaps I've lost my way slightly, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what we're talking about reviewing because the, the market's subject to a contract and you, you can't review a contract mid contract. Um, so are we talking specifically about the strategic direction of the market? And obviously any review that we, we would do would have to take into account that we're subject to an existing contract. Um, yeah. On the, on the subject of reviews, we should be reviewing everything all the time. So it's actually a bit of a no-brainer to say, yes, look, let's review it. Yep. Thank you. So we've had a move and a seconder. We've agreed. We're going with Councillor Goodall's motion. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thanks very much. <clears throat> cool. Thank you, Matt, for attendance. We can say that now. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Doyle. Um, item nine, forward plan. This is to consider are there any further items on the forward plan which we would like to add to the work plan. Does anyone have any that would like to add to the work plan that's not already there? Yeah. Yeah, there was two that stood out for me, Mr Chairman, uh, that I'd be curious for us to have a look at. Uh, the homelessness st strategy update is due to Cabinet on the 1st of December. Obviously, we're about to go into winter on the cost of, on the back of a cost of living crisis. I think it's essential for this uh, committee to discuss, you know, what's in that and how what we can ensure this council supports people as best we can. I did see another one, but I'm just looking for it. We're going to the next one. Yep. Um, is that one already going to health and well-being? Okay, I'll let them have it. No problem. Over to you then. Okay, and the second one was. And this has got one of those lovely massive titles that always makes me think, yeah, I need to look at that. Uh, regulation of social housing for, for the council's old st own stock. That is going to be a big, massive document that's going to you know, deserve to be scrutinised by this council. Something that regulates our entire council housing stock of around 4,000 houses and how many garages is, is an important document. And personally, I'd like to bring it to this committee. It's kind of good order. Do you want to come in on that one? I hear what Council Cook says. I just wondered if that is perhaps covered in the housing subcommittee. I'm not sure. No, I know. I'm, I'm... 
Anyone? Councillor Beagle. Uh, just to support Councillor Cook's suggestion. I think it is an important area. I think he should come to this committee. Okay, so rather than going, we'll, we'll turn the other way. Anyone against having that added to the work plan? No. Good. It's very important. Yeah. Okay. All oh, right, okay, so it's going to happen on the 10th of November, and we're not meeting until the 17th of November. So. So we'll either move a meeting or we just make or we'll be making suggestions just slightly after it's been reviewed by cabinet. Is that for decision or is that just a draft for them to review? I suppose that's the question. To set out the requirements for change within just still draft, right? Still draft at that point, Councillor Goodall. Thanks, Chair. Is there opportunity to put a, another meeting in, scrutiny meeting in before that point? Just a suggestion. If it's if if committee feels it's necessary. Chair's going to hate you forever now. <laughs> so, sorry, Mr. Chairman. If I can jump in, there is two ways to look at this. As that this Councillor Goodall says, we could look at an extra meeting some points in October. Or you could approach the uh, leader and the chief executive and say, does this have to go on the 10th of November? Or could it wait till after I next screaming? And if it's desperate to go, then we'll have to look at it. If they can go, all right, we can slide it a month if you guys want to look at it. We don't need another meeting, do we? So there is two ways to approach it. And I'd be happy to say you as chairman cover this up as you need to. Yeah. There are actually three ways to approach any of these things. One is that you scrutinise the decision after it's made. Um which is what scrutiny committees actually normally do. Yeah, I think we, we've always tried to do it before, to have input before it goes to them, but there's no reason why we can't do it, especially if it's you know, immediately after. I think that's a good idea. If we, we ask, can it be pushed back two weeks or whatever? If it can, great. If not, we perhaps go with the review it a week after. That's a good or you, you're going to come in there? No? You're just nodding, agreeing? Okay, so we're happy with that approach, and so we'll ask if it can be moved back a week or two at Cabinet. If not, we just review it a week later in here. Yep. Cool. Anything else to be added? Are you happy with the work plan? Happy. Good. Uh, next one is to actually look at the work plan. So, <clears throat> we've got... Update on a sure project, Q QPR quarter two, joint waste contract, and potentially this, the one we just talked about. Right, so my suggestion would be we don't add anything else because that's a mega meeting. It may be that some of the items end up not being ready in time and we push them back, but at the moment they, they're all looking okay. Um... Then we've got December. Okay. I suppose the answer to the question is is everyone happy with that agenda? So we'd have update on Assure, quarter two performance, joint waste contract update, and this item we just talked about. That's a good one. The joint waste contract update, that's a moving forward one because I'm looking at the review of what's what has happened on on ISAG. So I just wanted to check that. Can you remember, Joe? On the spot. If you can't, don't worry. I think it, the commit. I'm not clear what which direction this was coming from. I think it was for future, for future. But I don't know how far that is away, and whether this is a realistic, you know, the right meeting for it to come to, time-wise? My view would be if it's been reviewed by um, IS and G, that we take it off the agenda for there, put it as a TBC at the bottom to see where and when we come into it. Um, that gives us three substantive items for November, and then we see what IS and G are looking at and where we need to come into it. Yeah. In my view, anyone against that? No. 
Cool. Thank you. Um, anything else from anybody on that? No. Yes, we did. So item 10, let's go back one. Item 10, working group up updates. Uh, we had a working group that we agreed we haven't met, which is to look at the QPR in general. Um, is there anyone, now that we've got new members in here, is there anybody that wants to join that group to look at the quarterly performance report and whether we want to make any changes, tweaks, whether it's fit for purpose? Andy Cooper. I'll join that group. Chair, thank you. Great. It was uh, me, Simon Goodall, Chris Cook, and Andy Cooper. Chris Cook, you happy to stay on it? Yeah. Simon Goodall? I'm happy to uh, resign my position for <laughs> Councillor Cooper. Thank you. Cool. And then Danny wants to be added. Yeah, we'll add Danny Cook. Cool. <laughs> cool, thank you. So I would suggest we, yeah, we try and get it. We obviously want to try and get something changed by the, before the end of municipal year, certainly. But it would be good to try and do it by the end of this year for the next QPR after that. Cool, thank you. Um, then I've, we've added it here within, within the corporate screening work plan, which is the action log. So we've talked in here before about sometimes recommendations get put forward, but then we don't ever really track them or we'll come back to them. So there's now an action log which you've all had distributed. I suppose any comments, are you happy with it? And we, we just use that going forward to, to track things. That's a good one. I think it does what it says on the tin. Thanks. <laughs> so, and I think, so you're happy we'll add it into the item. We add it as an agenda item, we'll just add it under 11. Make that a combined item. Yeah, make it a combined item, and then each meeting we then review it. We try and review it in advance. It might be that we've all reviewed it and we're all happy, that's fine. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, but the office are coming in here with solutions. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so ideally we'd review it in advance and we'd all be happy with it. If not, we'd discuss Brilliant. it here. Cool. Anything else from anybody before we close the meeting? No? Right, that concludes the business for this meeting, and I'll close the meeting at. 7 12. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you.